Open your Bible with me to Deuteronomy chapter 22. We're going to read just one verse. And it's going to be enough to get in trouble over. But I didn't say it. God did. Let's, let's ask him to bless us. Lord, we ask you to bless this message. Lord, we ask you to bless your word. We know you have blessed your word, but may people revere your word and realize that it's right. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Here's the verse, Deuteronomy 22 and 5. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Uh-oh. We're not supposed to read that, are we? We'll get canceled. The woke people get mad. You know, because, I mean, you just you, I guess we're supposed to do like Jehudi did and just cut that right out of our Bible, right? What in the world? This started this week because I was watching the news. I mean, you can't even watch the not the local news anymore without your head just smoking. You know? And and the Knox County you know, school starting here. We prayed for our kids up here today. You know, you look at it sometimes you think, what is the system doing to our kids? And the Knox County school school system's getting sued right now because the little boy who was six years old, who is now eight, he decided when he was six that he wanted to be a woman, a girl. So now he's an eight-year-old girl, and the school system's not providing the proper bathroom for him, and I don't know what that means. I mean, you still only got two sexes, right? Do we have to have a third bathroom? I, I don't know, but I thought, I'd like to, those parents, I would really like to counsel with them, right? <laughs> Six years old, and you're encouraging your kid to change sexes. Oh, my, and, and then like two weeks ago, I read, uh, no, I saw this on the news too. This is on the national news. And uh, this guy who was, uh, I don't even know what you call him, transvestite, he pretended it was a man who was pretending to be a woman. That's not the politically correct way to say it, but it was a man who was pretending to be a woman. And he had been guilty of some crimes, and he finally came to a court. And the court system found him guilty, and they sentenced him to 20 or 30 years. But, of course, because he had identified, they had to send him to the woman's prison. Now he's got two inmates pregnant. <laughs> so I'm sitting there looking at that, and I'm thinking, okay, what man who's going to know he's going to prison for 20 or 30 years ain't just going to say, I'm identified... <laughs> Send me to the woman's prison. But such is the world that, that we live in today. And uh, it just happened to be about the same day I was flipping by a TV land, I think it was, or me TV, where I stay a lot. And I, I, I wasn't watching the show, but I was channel surfing. I do that a lot. You do that. just <laughs> And I hit on MASH. Now, Klinger used to be funny. But this was so apropos for the day that we lived in. This was probably videoed back in filmed back in the 70s, I guess, MASH was. And, and Klinger, just a few minutes I watched, had finally got his wish. You know, Klinger always dressed up like a woman. He was in the Korean War, and he was over in Korea. All Klinger was trying to do was get out of the Army, right? By getting them to certify him as being crazy. He finally got his wish. They had sent him to a, a psychologist, and the psychologist had finally relented and said, okay, I'm getting you out of here. And he says, uh, I'm checking this box that you're a, a transvestite. And Klinger says, no way. I'm crazy, but I'm not that. <laughs> he didn't want out of the army with that hanging over him. He said, just last me as crazy. And they wouldn't do that, so Klinger had glad to stay in the in the military there. Now, Klinger was funny, but the funny stuff that we used to look at has become normalized today that, that we're living in. And you, you think, my goodness. Uh, but we, as Christians, we have to look at it and say, well, how should we respond to this kind of stuff as Christians? And, and I, I've thought about that, and I've realized that, you know, we're still under the command to love people, love God and love people. 
And some people have trouble, they don't understand that you can love somebody and not love the things that they do. You can love the sinner and not condone the sin. Yeah, but, you know, we've got Christian, we've got the Methodist church splitting today over this very same kind of stuff, you know, because they can't understand that, that, that if, if God said it, then that's the way it is. We can't vote God's word out. If we're going to be Christians, we're going to be, we can, we can love people, but we can't condone the sin. The church, no individual Christian, nor any governing body of a church, can decide that, hey, we're going to vote and call this uh, normal. We're go we can never condone what God's already condemned it. Amen. And God's condemned it and said, this is disgusting. That's what the word abomination means to us. Now, if you go back to uh, when mom and dad were a little girl, I mean, they, the churches, a lot of these old mountain Baptist churches, some of them in town, I guess, they interpreted this verse really differently because they couldn't imagine the day that we were going to live in today. And, and they, they were wrong, but they tried to interpret it the best they could, and they thought, uh, uh, you, you women, boy, you better have your dress on. Don't you put on a pair of jeans or nothing like that because it's against the Bible. Now we see exactly what it's talking about. It's a precept, you know, let, let, uh, don't let your women put on stuff pertaining to a man. Don't let your man put on stuff pertaining to a woman, you know, because uh, God's not the author of confusion. But behind every precept is a principle. The precept is just what we read. The principle is that there is a distinction of the sexes. And there should be. I have a daughter she can do whatever she chooses to do in this world but see still there's a distinction between the males and the females and that's what it's like the little boy in Knoxville you know six years old he wants to switch which I did appreciate they at least played the the next segment they had a, a, a 16 year old girl or something on there and she had been through all these changes and everything because it was like 10 or something she wanted to change and her parents encouraged her to do all that. Now she's 16, she's reached puberty and she's going around telling what a stupid mistake this is and it's, a lot of this stuff's irreversible. And there's a, lot of, there's, there's, more than, there's a lot of people out there that are like that. They went through this and then they've regretted it and then they realize, well, they just messed up so they're trying to tell other people about it. But... Um, you ask yourself, well, why does God say this? There's a reason. What we're seeing in our society right now with all this LGBTQ question mark plus stuff is not the sickness, it's the symptoms of a sick society that we're living in. It's just a bunch of confusion. It's all messed up. And this is moral law, by the way. I, John Wesley said this. This is my theology, and I believe he's right. And the Methodist Church used to believe what John Wesley said. John Wesley said when Jesus died on the cross, that loosed us from all the sacrificial laws. We don't have to bring animals to the church and sacrifice them anymore. But he said in no way did that loose us from the moral laws, such as the Ten Commandments and such as this here. That's just, God's not the author of confusion, if you want the New Testament verse here uh, but, but you think about, well, if this is a symptom of a sick society, you think, well, how did we get here? By the way, the American Psychological Association in their Diagnostic and Statistical, Statistical Manual used to say all the way up until the latter part of the 20th century that these, a lot of these deviant behaviors today that have been normalized, they, they had them all filed under mental illness. And that brings me back around, how should a Christian react to this? You can love the sinner and not con condone the sin. And it helps to realize sometimes that these folks are really just mentally ill. But society ain't helping them because they're encouraging that as a form of normalcy. Even a preferred thing anymore in some of these, these places. Uh, one of the quickest ways to get hired these days, I guess, is uh, be that kind of a minority, I guess. But uh, how did we get here? I don't know, but this is my opinion. I, I think that the, the gender roles have become more vague even in my lifetime. 
We just got an awful lot of sissy men anymore, <laughs> just to put it bluntly. There's a lot of kids growing up in homes without any kind of a male role model at all, all the broken homes and everything. But uh, uh, we, we've, we've even got a lot of sissy preachers. You know, they, I, I listen to stuff on the radio a lot of times, and, you know, the people I've known in my life, and I'm like, man, them are just sissy preachers, you know. <laughs> Bless them for preaching God's word, but give me them old-time preachers from back like Peter Cartwright, who's <laughs> old circuit riders, riding the, their days across the prairie out there and in all kinds of weather. And the, in fact, there was a saying back then that said the, the weather was so bad, it said it ain't fit for nobody out there tonight but animals and circuit riders. <laughs> I've read that Peter Cartwright book two or three times, I probably think three times in my life. I love that story. You know, he's a... Out there sleeping on the prairie. They wouldn't know where to tie his horse. He had to sleep and hold his reins in your hands. <laughs> you come to a river, you just swim across the river. The days there's too many preachers would worry they'd get their Rolex wet or something. <laughs> Francis Asbury, leave up in Virginia and come down through the French Broad Valley over into North Carolina thousands of mi miles every year. Just to come and preach. I mean, boy, preachers used to be somebody that, you know, men could admire. When, where the men were, were manly men. So then I got to think about our biblical heroes in the Bible. You know, there's old Jacob. He had a lot of problems that he had to grow out of, didn't he? But uh, he was out there on the farm working. He was camping in the wilderness, you know, and everything. Joshua, there's a warrior. You read the the list of our heroes in Hebrews chapter 11 and all the people that did great exploits and they, these were manly men. And I got down to the New Testament thinking about them. I thought, well, I'm going to give you three this morning from the New Testament people I admire. There's old John the Baptist. You talk about a fiery preacher. He's out there in the wilderness on the banks of the Jordan wearing a camel skin suit and he's living off of bugs and honey. <laughs> And the people are coming to see him, and he's standing out there on the rock demanding repentance out of them people. And some of them wanted to kill him because of that. But a lot of them repented, didn't they? And he baptized them out there. We need more fiery preachers like that. Then there's, there's Paul, a great hero of the New Testament. A tent maker. You keep up with his journeys, he's sailing everywhere on ships, and in. And you read his writings, and oh, Paul, he likes sports, too. He, he referred to somebody as beating again. He's, he's seen the Olympics. See, he talks about that, law, that Olympic crown of laurels that they would wear if they run a good race. And he'd, he'd take things about the, the sports, and he'd apply it to the Christian life. Let us run with patience the race that's set before us. You know? And he had all kinds of things like this. He'd say, you know, Paul, you can tell he, he liked sports back then, too. Racing and uh, Olympic references, and then you read about him in Second Corinthians chapter eleven. Is all the things that he went through. You know, he's been beaten, he's been thrown in jail, he's been in shipwrecks, and all these other things. But he just kept going forward for God. We need more men like that. And, and then here's the Jesus of the Bible, so the, who the ultimate one that we finally came up with. And I said the Jesus of the Bible, not to be confused with that other one. That's portrayed some. There's a Jesus of the Bible, then there's a non-biblical Jesus that the world wants to portray sometimes. But the Jesus of the Scripture seems to me like he, he's a Jesus that like being in a boat, didn't he? Every time you turn around, he's in a boat. He even gets in a boat and he uses it for a pulpit and push it out there somewhere. And Jesus is sailing everywhere in a boat. He's a Jesus that looked to me like he liked riding horses. He rode them back then. He's coming back on one one of these days. He, he's a Jesus that was going to banquets. Remember, they, they, they called him a glutton for that because he was going to some sinner's house and having a banquet with them all the time. He, he was a man who uh, loved to hike long distances with his friends, camping on the side of the Mount of Olives. He was a Jesus that appreciated humor. Sometimes folks don't realize that. We read what Jesus' teaching is in the Bible, and yes, it's a serious point, but you realize that when he first said it, people kind of chuckled as he made his point. When he talked about them Pharisees, he said, you know, they'll, they'll gag on a gnat and swallow a camel. You can get a picture of that in your head. 
Or he said, before you get picking on everybody else, said you ought to get that speck of sawdust out, uh, get that get that log out of your eye before you worry about getting that speck of sawdust out of your friend's eye. Beams and moats, to use the, the King James language there. And no way is the Jesus of the Bible a sissy boy. But sometimes he portrayed that in the world. The Jesus of the Bible is the one who who went in among some of the most powerful people of his day and turned over their tables and kicked their money and their doves and everything else all over the table. And he, he said, this is my father's house and you've turned it into a den of thieves. And he's the same one told that same bunch. said, said uh, they are bragging about their heritage from being from Moses. He said, you're of your father, the devil. He said, you're a generation of vipers. You're, that means you're a bunch of snakes and the granddaddies is a bunch of snakes. But have you ever noticed in the Bible that the ones that Jesus got the most angry with were always the religious people? The ones who should know better, the ones who were the religious leaders of the day is the one that he really had the anger toward. For the sinner, he had compassion upon them, but they were sinners too, but they should have known better. See, see, they didn't think they had any sin. That's why Jesus said, uh, sorry, I only come to save those which were lost. I didn't come to call the righteous to repentance. They wasn't no righteous ones. None righteous, no, not one. But there's a lot of people back then, a lot of people today that think they don't need no repentance because they think, I'm a righteous. I'm all right. And Jesus said, well, I can't help you because I only come to save sinners. Jesus of the Bible is a brave man. He was so brave that he stood up for what's right and he never lost his integrity even though it cost him his life. That's about as brave as you can get, ain't it? Here's the main principle for the church, I think. We've got to love the lost. We'll never win anybody if we don't love the lost. We don't have to condone the sins of the lost. But we can also realize that the ways of the world are not the ways of God. And we can also realize that uh, as Christians, we're called to be holy. That's even become a bad word in some people's minds because they don't realize what it is. They get this picture of some kind of holy roller or something. But holy literally just means that you're different in a good way. God's holy. He's different in a good way. God says, because I'm holy, be you therefore holy also. It means you're different. You're the light in this world of darkness that we live in. So I close this morning with saying, are you one of God's people? If you are, then God's called you to a much higher standard than this lost world that we live in out here. And that you, as the people of God, are the only hope for this lost world. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for the word of God. We don't mean to be offensive to anybody, Lord, but we just mean to take a stand for the word of God. That it has precedent over anything that our government votes in or anybody else, Lord. But we're going to go back and say we're people of the book. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.